Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jesus Name Ministries. Uh, hope you're doing fine today. Hope everyone is uh, having a great morning today. Uh, if you are in church today, uh, learning about Jesus, that's pretty awesome. Uh, we just uh, wanted to come on here and talk about uh, what uh, John 4 and 24 talks about, and it says, Honest Worship. And uh, that's going to be the subject today of our content, is honest worship. Um, honesty is something that is not found too often today. It's not, it is a virtue that seems to be long lost uh, in our society today, unfortunately. And uh, so we're just going to kind of go through and read uh, the scripture that that we're going to be talking about and pulling this out of, um, but we're we're just going to kind of touch on it and then we'll go back in and read more of that scripture in depth and kind of break it down. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the confusion. Now we, we're talking about honest worship. Um, now we know with honest worship, there is some dishonest worship. There is a flip side almost to everything that we we experience in life. So there is a good, there's an evil, there's a, uh, a right, there's a wrong, there's a uh, sweet, there's a sour. Uh, there's a light, there's a darkness. Um, there's a yin, there's a yang, so to speak. Um, anyhow, if there is a peace, then there is chaos. And so... Those things, if there's a right, there's a wrong again. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is talk about how the differences play out. And uh, once again, we're going we're gonna to focus on religion. And you say, well, why, why do we speak about religion so often? Well, because Jesus dedicated most of his ministry to religion. Uh, and if you don't believe that, you just haven't read the Gospels because Jesus constantly railed on what was and what was failing people. What was the, the deceptors, those people that were just, just don't take my word for it, take the words of Jesus for it. Go read Matthew 23. Uh, outside of the miracles done, the, the uh, healings, the the blind receiving their sight, the, the deaf hearing again, the, the lame walking again, the, the issue of blood being healed, uh, the, the demonic uh, spirits being, uh, people being delivered from the demonic spirits, um, Jesus teaching uh, those uh, that he had picked and chosen, and the very betrayal of those he chose. Um, this is the story. This is the three and a half years that we uh, that is recorded or that has been told. That is what we have today of Jesus, and these are the stories that uh, that has made it to our ears, to our um, uh, eyes that we could read about. So, how much of that validation? It is what we have today. And we can only go by what we have. And uh, in that, we have to use the Spirit of God to discern what is lining up with what Jesus meant um, and, and, and how it all jives together. And uh, so that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Honest worship is what God is seeking. And uh, so... And, and then the confusion, there, the, again, we know that there is a opposite of, of what God wants. There is an evil force. There is a deceptor that is trying to cause chaos. And so we have a real Jesus and we have a fake Jesus. So in, in today's world, there are many preaching, teaching, and evangelizing a fake Jesus. I personally call it a plastic Jesus. 
Uh, now that could be an ornament setting on your dash of your car. That could be a bobblehead Jesus. That could be your, your necklace, your rosary, whatever that plastic Jesus is to you. It could be your credit card. Might be your plastic Jesus. But many are serving that plastic Jesus. Many are preaching that plastic Jesus because that plastic Jesus is building your churches. That plastic Jesus is putting new carpet in your buildings. That plastic Jesus is sending uh, these, these pastors and, and evangelists on extravagant vacations. It's buying them new cars. It's, it's, it's giving them wealth. Uh, and and those those that plastic Jesus is full of cookies and cakes for those ladies auxiliary meetings. So we have that plastic Jesus, that that uh, material Jesus that everybody wants to go to, and that's that's exactly what religion is today. It's that material Jesus. Nobody wants any part of that spiritual Jesus. No one wants to pick up the cross. Nobody wants to deny themselves of their desires and their flesh and the lust that they have burning within them. They don't want to give away those things. They want and want and want and want to fill the lust of their own flesh. They don't want to come under subjection to the, the mercy and the law of Jesus and the words of Jesus Christ. They would rather go through the chaos. They would rather see a man to tell them and point a finger at them and say, no, you can't do that and you should do this and do that. They would rather, as Israel did when Samuel was, was there, they said, I want a king. I don't want God's spirit moving on you and telling us what to do anymore. We want a king that we can manipulate. And that's exactly why people love to flock to churches. That's why they love to have a man over them so they can manipulate them, so there can be a hierarchy, so they can climb the ladder, that corporate business ladder of success that we've all been trained to see in our success. And that's exactly where we're at today with many of these churches. Right, so anyhow, we look at religion as being chaos, confusing. How is it confusing? It's confusing because every evil work is in it. When you have people vying for positions and, and, and functions within a church, and you have a hierarchical uh, situation, you have a man telling you that he will be your covering over you for God, and he will stand before God for you. That is a lie from hell, and that is no one but the Antichrist that they are trying to place in between you and God. They are trying to be that Antichrist because that's the only one that is mentioned in the Bible that would come between you and God, and that is what we are talking about today. So anyhow, the confusion and every evil work. Uh, when we look at Mark 7, and we will get to John 4 uh, soon, but I wanted to kind of mention, we want to, we want to show you that, that yin and yang, that, that positive and negative part, that chaos, that confusion. And, and it says that religion in Mark 7, 6, and 13, it says, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, there's a lot of people in religion today going to uh, the so-called church services that are honoring him with their lips. They're calling out the name of Jesus. They're singing uh, Kumbaya, I love you Jesus songs, but their heart is far from Jesus. They are not walking the walk. They are not interested in giving up their sin. They are not interested in applying their life to what Jesus told them to do. They are not interested in picking up a cross. They are not interested in following Jesus. They are interested in staying within the bounds of what man has told them to do. They are going to stay within that structure of that building at church, those bylaws of the church, so that they can maintain a position in a church. And it says, albeit in vain. What does in vain mean? For nothing. 
do they worship me? Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. These are not of God. These commandments are not of God. They're not of Jesus. They're nothing what Jesus said. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like you do. And Jesus also railed on the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you, you, you choke on a gnat, but you swallow a camel. The simple things you omit. What would be the simple things? Like loving your neighbor as yourself. Helping the, the Samaritan person that got beat up by the roadside by a, by a, 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 a thief. Left for dead. Walking over and helping that person. No, you're going to walk on the other side because you don't want to be late for church. Because you see, you have to live to the doctrines of the commandments of men. You can't be late for that business meeting at church because you might miss something. You, you don't want to be knocked down a notch or two in your, your hierarchical position in that church. You want to be known as being punctual. You want to have the accolades reported at the end of the year that, hey, brother, sister, so-and-so has been faithful and not one time have they missed this or that. Have they done what stepped out of line from what the pastor said? They are a model Christian. That's what you want to hear. You have no, no desire to hear in the end, thou good and faithful servant, I have made you ruler over little, and come, and I will make you ruler over many. You have no desire to hear those words from Jesus because you are not willing to give up your desires of the flesh. You are not willing to pick up the cross that Jesus gave to you. Verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own traditions. Skipping down to 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things like ye do. Making the word of God void. Through your tradition. Your tradition is nullifying the effectiveness effectiveness of the Word of God, which segues us exactly to the other scripture I wanted to take you to. And let's, let's go over there now, and we're going to go jump over here to Ephesians. We're going to go to 4 and around verse 11, somewhere here. Now we know that in John, in Matthew actually, chapter 23, and, and actually, let me, let me go back there before we go here. It just takes a couple, couple uh, clicks here. So let's go to Matthew 23. Just, just fine here. And let's just go here. You're going to see. And what is he saying here? He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. Who are the scribes and the Pharisees? They are the religious of the known day of Jesus at that time. They are the today's pastors. They are today's board meeting board members. They are today's elders in the churches today. That's who they represent here. And he said, but all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feast. They sit on platforms, they got king's chairs, 
and the chief seats in the synagogues. See, I bet you didn't know a synagogue back in those times were just a place that you could walk in and you could you could stand up and read read scriptures. There was no pastors, no no teachers, no no preachers. That's how Jesus was able to stand up and read Isaiah and say, "This day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears." But we've we've made churches. Uh, a leadership thing. We've made churches to come under a godlike man. And uh, let me just put a shameless plug out there. We we just started new and some podcast, uh, random uh, podcast, and with w- random I say with with uh, various people from different walks, and um, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Uh, Perry's World Raw, and that Perry is P E R R E E S World Raw, one word uh, dot um, uh, in on YouTube, and you will find in the live section we did a podcast, and then you will see how some folks um, will explain to you and, and tell you their views of of what they have known in church and where where they've come from. And it's very interesting to see and hear the perspective of, of what we're teaching you today, what we're talking about today, what we're sharing with you. Uh, so here we go. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the markets, and to be called of men rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher. But be ye not called rabbi. Notice these are red letter words. These are um, purported to be direct wording of Jesus Christ himself. For one is your master, not five, not various streams in your life, not, not, a, not a plethora of, uh, of, of different sources. For one Singular one is your master, even Christ. Jesus Christ is your master. And the next verse, and all you are brethren. You are on the same playing field. Now that is Matthew 23 and verse 8. All you are brethren. There's no big eyes, little U's. There's no teachers. There's no preachers. There's no pastors. There's no evangelist. There is none of the such. There's no apostles, prophets. There's no hierarchy in my kingdom. And call no man your father upon the earth. And the father that he's talking about, he's not talking about your earthly dad. He's talking about in the sense of that you are obedient to someone spiritually as father, such as a priest, such as a pastor, as we call them today in our religion, our religious world. Okay. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he shall humble himself. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And it continues on with the woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. How they devour. And you can read this on your own. You can go right through and and, and line up many churches with this. Um, So anyhow. Now we're going to go back to Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians 11. Or 4 and 11. That's where we're going. Now, let's read this again. Now, what you've got here is you have Paul, the 
Paul of Tarsus that comes along. Now, uh, in in our in our podcast, we we had asked, um, do you know that Paul was the only one who purported that Jesus harmed him? Nowhere else do you find anyone blaming Jesus of harming them. But Paul said he was struck down on the road to Damascus and blinded. His sight was taken away by Jesus himself. That should send red flashing lights to you. Because I've never heard of Jesus taking sight. He always gave sight. I've never heard of Jesus maiming people. I've heard of him healing people. And that should be something troubling to you. And when this is preached, when you hear that, you should question who's saying that and why would they repeat that? Why would they believe that? But you know what? We have the religious filters on. So here we go. Let's let's get on here. Just thought I'd throw that in there. That, that was free. All right. And Paul says, oh, remember what we just read. Jesus said one master, one teacher, not many, not two, not three. And then here we got Paul coming along. And he says that he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is wrong with that? You see the old law creep? See how Paul is directly in conflict with what Jesus said? No wonder Paul hasn't, you don't find anywhere where Paul has quoted sayings from Jesus. Because Paul wasn't interested in what Jesus said. Paul was creating his own religion. Paul just needed to drag Jesus along to keep our attention and keep us off the path of what he was really trying to do. And that would be to lead us away from Jesus. You see, by inserting man back into the role of salvation, now, after Jesus took away, when Jesus cut down that middle wall partition, when Jesus took away the veil, And it was ripped in two. And no longer did it take a priest to go before God before or for you and I. Now we can boldly go through and come to the throne of grace through the name of Jesus who died once and for all. But now Paul comes back in in Ephesians 11 and says, guess what? It's not just one. It's not just Jesus. Matter of fact, you don't have just one master. I, let, me re, let, me, let me introduce to you five new avenues, five new streams for you to become perfected. This church that I'm talking about, speaking of Paul, you're going to need pastors 
Back to man. This is what you need. Now Jesus must have been lying because he said he was the only one you needed. But I'm here to tell you he's not the only one you need. Because I'm telling you right now, you need some pastors, you need some evangelists, you need some teachers, you need the some apostles. And Paul made himself an apostle. No one else called him apostle. At least from the council or original church. You can find that in the book of Acts. You could find that in Paul's letters when he complains about it. And uh, when he basically tells those that he had converted to his teachings that uh, they believe him even though he may not be believed by Peter and James and John, that's who he's talking about in those scriptures. Um, and you need some, a prophet, some prophets. So this opens up a whole new stream, five new avenues for man to interject himself and say that he is called of God to interject himself into your life and now become a stumbling block for you to make it to heaven when Jesus clearly made the way for you by his precious blood, his atonement, and now Paul is inserting that man now has a role back into your life for you to become perfected to find salvation. You see, this benefits man. It feeds man's desire to rule, to exercise his pride and his wealth. And it is his favored path to destruction. You see, this is flesh. The flesh says, give me all that I can get while I can get it. Because I'm not going anywhere after I die anyhow. The flesh is going back to the earth from whence it came. It knows this is the end for it. But the spirit will live on for an eternity. And this is where there is a battle. This is where there is an interjection that you must fight. So we see here that Paul made his own religious doctrine. And would lead many, not to, but away from Jesus. From the real teacher. So I want to go back to John 4 and 24. And let's start looking at. Actually, let's, let's start back up at uh, probably we just start at the beginning there. start at the beginning when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples he left Judea and departed again into Galilee and he must needs go through Samaria then cometh he to the city of Samaria which is called Sychar near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied. Okay. Okay. 
Jesus being wearied. Let me find it again. With his journey set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Uh, I believe that was around 9 a.m. in the morning. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. So he was there alone at the well, having a seat, just taking a rest. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, are asking me to give you a drink of water? She was a little curious. Was this a trick? Which, I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews aren't supposed to be talking with the Samaritans, let alone asking for a drink of water. And I'm just paraphrasing this to make it a little easier. This is the old uh, English, the KJV, and I'm just trying to soften it down. You can read this in most version that you would like. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's talking to you, give me to drink, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. Wow. So get this. You've got Jesus sitting down at this well, knowing full well, pardon the pun, that it was Jacob's well, knowing that this lady, they still had a religious connection to Jacob, their father, they called, and you'll see that later on here in the scripture we're going to be reading. And Jesus just said, you should be asking me for a drink. Now she's like, hmm, something a little different about this little conversation here. Now she's a little inquisitive, saying, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, here you are talking to me? And he said, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew that I was Jesus Christ, if you knew that I was the Lamb slain or going to be slain before the foundation of the world, if you knew that I was going to be your Savior and I am the Messiah, and you would be asking me for a drink of water because the water I would give you, you wouldn't thirst again because it's living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you don't even have nothing to draw with. You don't have anything to dip the water out with. And the well's deep from whence or where do you have this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? You greater than our father Jacob? This is Jacob's well. Still today is, is providing us water. He dug himself or with his, with his servants and is still producing water. And Jesus answered and said unto her, if, oh, we went, moved on, sorry. And, and, and Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. So you're drinking of Jacob's well. You're going you're gonna to have to come back and drink again because you're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now we're talking, right? Now we're talking. everlasting life. Now, I think he's really got the woman's attention. The woman said unto him, Sir, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw, that I ain't got to come back here and keep taking from it. I'm tired of 
lugging these pails day in and day out to come get water. Jesus said unto her, Go, call your husband, and come on back. Jesus was baiting her. He already knew. How do I know he already knew? The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said. You didn't lie. You said you had no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he that you're with now is not your husband. And you didn't lie to me. You said you, you were honest. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I'm perceiving that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now this is what the Jews said. Now she's saying that, you know, us Samaritans, now our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but the Jews say that we have to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. Now she just said that the prophets, the Jews, and the fathers one side said they have to worship in Jerusalem. The other side says they have to worship in the mountain. And Jesus said, believe me. The hour cometh. The time is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh. There's coming a time, and now is. And actually, now is the time, he said. When the true, when the true, when the honest, Worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Think of that. The time will come, and it's actually here, he said, right now, that you're not going to have to worship in the mountain and you're not going to have to worship in Jerusalem. That you can start right now worshiping God in spirit and in truth. You can worship him in honesty. You don't have to go to a place anymore. You don't have to show up at the temple you don't have to show up at a synagogue, but you can worship God right where you are. As a matter of fact, it's preferred. As a matter of fact, let's read on. Let's go ahead. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, you should worship what you know not what. We worship the, uh, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. That's the way he wants to be worshiped. Honest worship in spirit and in truth. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. For God, verse 24, is a spirit, and they that worship him, here we go, is this an option? For they that worship him must Worship him in spirit and in truth. 
You must honestly worship God. Now, I'm pretty sure there's not a whole lot of honest worshipers. Again, we go back to that plastic Jesus. We go back to that Egypt Jesus, that golden calf Jesus, that I want something material from God to be happy. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, in spirit, and in truth. Let's wrap this up. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, wow, man. Let's feel the Lord right now. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I'm come. Here I am. It's me. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to fulfill the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye that there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that true saying, One soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And here we are. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the sayings of the woman. And this is very notable here. They believed on Jesus by the witness of the woman, which testified. And I present to you today, Jesus never talked about preachers. Jesus never talked about pastors. Jesus never sanctioned any of those ministries that Paul mentions. They were to become witnesses. What is a witness? You tell them what you observed of Jesus. What he tells you, what he does for you, how he works in your life, and how you found him. You are his witness. You are not his preacher. You are not his teacher. You are not his pastor. You are not his apostle. You are not his prophet. You are his witness. And as we finish this up, so when the Samaritans were coming to him, he besought him, they besought him that he would tarry with them or come stay with them. And he abode there for two days. Jesus went back with them for two days in Samaria, and many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of your saying, not because of what you witnessed, for we have heard him ourselves. And I will tell you today, you too can hear him 
for yourself. You don't need to just have my witness. You don't need to have anyone else's witness. But you can talk to Jesus right now, anytime, any given day, by the mention of his name, and he will connect with you. You will read his word, learn about him. He said, I am meek and lowly, and I will reach out to you. He said it to the woman, now we believe, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and now that this is indeed, and we know that this is indeed the Christ. You know what they mean by that? This is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. After two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. And I hope there was something that would bring you closer to Jesus today with this ministry, with the words that we have tried to share with you. I have a lot more notes. We have a lot more slides. I am not going to go into them today uh, to belabor. I feel the message has been given. Um, we have a whole lot more slides that uh, we could go through. Um, I will not uh, go through them and um, use up any more of your time. I appreciate those. I'll just uh, quickly run through this uh, the sets here. But uh, maybe we'll get back into these sometime. Um, but there is lots of preparation that we try to put into this. And, and, and the love of God, we just want to share with you. And, and give you the best chance to make heaven your home and be a witness to God. I'm not your teacher. The Holy Ghost is your teacher. He said he will not leave you comfortless, but he will come to you, John 14 and 18. He said, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Those folks looking for that plastic Jesus are not going to find him. They will not see him because they're looking to the world. That plastic Jesus is the world. They're looking for the hype. They're looking for the power. They're looking for, for the position. They're not going to find him in the power of peace. It's going to be chaos. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. And Matthew 24 and 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, They asked him. This, this is where they asked him. If you go to Matthew 24, start at the beginning. His disciples said, Lord, what are going to be the signs in the end of your coming? And his first thing out of his mouth was, Take heed that no man deceive you. Did he say the devil? Did he say, oh, don't, don't. Just stay clear of the devil and you'll be all right. Nope. He said, man, who is at the top of every church? Our known modern churches today. Man. If that don't tell you something, I don't know what to tell you. First John, we'll, we'll end with this here today. And we'll read two different translations here. King James Version said, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him, talking about Jesus, abideth in you. It lives in you. And you don't need any man to teach you, but that same anointing, that Holy Ghost, that Spirit of Christ, teaches you all things and is truth. That's how you're going to worship. That's how you're going to honestly worship God. It is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall live in him. And let's look at the ESV translation. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide or live in him. 
God bless you. Thanks for watching and spending your time today uh, listening. We appreciate everyone. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. And uh, God bless you and your family. And uh, go in peace and learn of Jesus. He loves you and God bless you. Amen.